If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grammaric Show. Freshly back from Texas. Freshly, freshy. Last I, don't night. Feel, I don't feel very fresh. No, me either. I slept pretty good last night, though, in my bed. Yeah. After like three hours a night for several nights. Yeah. At least it feels like three hours a night. Might have been less, might have been more. I don't think a lot more. It's hard to tell when you're uh, when you're sleeping on like ground in a tent and you're roll you're waking up every like I woke up a lot I think you know oh yeah I was kind of in and out of dream state a little bit yeah well the first night I didn't have an air mattress so I just slept on the hard Texas clay <laughs> ground with nothing <laughs> just a sleeping bag so it was extremely hard and then even with the air mattress. Uh, I slept pretty pretty decent after that, but it was just like by then you're staying up late and then getting up early. It's hard to yeah. get in all the great times. I know big time big thanks to everybody that showed up to our event and the people that put it on. Laura and the Snake yeah. Snake Brothers and Yeah, we had David. a great great turnout. Oh, it was unbelievable though. It was just the people there were just amazing. Yeah, and it was a real nice mix of like it was nice to add all the live music. You know, the jamming really goes to another level from our, from our normal events because we have an actual stage with musicians performing. And then we had the presentations too, but you know, this one really focused. It had a lot more time for people to party and hang out too. So, and a yeah. lot of that happened, and everyone really embraced it. It seemed to be almost like we found the perfect mix of it all. You know. Yeah, and just to see fifty dollar dynasty live playing their their procession album, I mean that was incredible. One of my highlights for sure. The pretty tight band, eh? Oh, it's uh, I just love it. I love that album. Love the band. Did you? And I'm not even like into new music or anything. Like I don't really listen to a lot of new music. So, did you cry when they covered Pink Floyd? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I forget. I was talking to. I was like, hey. I bet you Graham's crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's that it's that album that gets me. I mean, you guys surprised me. I gotta say, you guys surprised me with that with that eclipse thing. We were there for the eclipse, and it was all cloudy, and we were sort of doing these like this. We did this big circle. Dave Matheson led us through this circle of sort of trying to cloud bust and stuff. That was pretty fun, and it was very spontaneous. And then, you know, you guys timed you guys timed the dark side of the moon to the eclipse and did you know that the last song on that is called eclipse yes yeah that's why we did it that's why we did it and we made it so that it would end just like a like about a 30 to 45 seconds after totality started and but we couldn't have predicted that the clouds would break right when it ended too i mean that oh, was I just like it was the perfect crescendo to like a 45 minute psychedelic experience Oh yeah, it was like, and everything under the sun is in tune, but the sun is eclipsed by the moon, and it stops, and then like a couple seconds later, the sun the sun broke through, like it was crazy the timing. I mean, yeah, actually, like, I, I, I couldn't find the clouds. The clouds, I liked it. It was it, it just brought this anticipation. Everybody was like yelling and screaming for the sun to come through the clouds. It was it was really cool. Yeah, and it kept doing it, you know, every once yeah. in a while it would poke through and poke through. So every five or ten minutes you'd get a good glimpse of it. Yeah. And uh didn't really have to wear the glasses. Didn't that was the coolest thing is we didn't have to wear the glasses. So we got to see almost the whole thing with just sunglasses because there's just enough clouds to filter it out so you could just see it perfectly with the naked eye. 
Right, right. I guess I never really realized that at, at first. That So the real cool thing about that is that's like, if you would have been standing there 10,000 years ago, you would have seen that eclipse coming. You would have seen it coming the whole time. You would have looked up and seen the sun half covered and been like, what the fuck is going on? Whereas other than that, there's no, until it's like right upon you, you don't really see it coming. You know what I mean? Like even when there was just a fraction of the sun left, it was still fairly bright outside, you know? Yeah. If yeah. you're an ancient, you might not even notice until all of a sudden it was just like dark. Yeah. But the clouds, yeah. if you're an ancient, you would look up and, you know, we were able to watch the whole thing sort of come together with the naked eye. Pretty amazing. Yeah. No one that was there will ever forget that. No, it was, it was incredible. Yeah. I got a couple things on video too where everybody was... I was trying to show the darkness of how it was all dark and then everybody's cheering because the sun was coming, coming back through. Like it was, it was, it was very cool. We started it back up with, uh, here comes the sun. You know what, you know what I forgot is how long it took for it. Once it goes, once it starts broaching the, the top of it, it takes a long time for it to go there. Right. Yeah. It was about an hour and 20 minutes of watching it come on to it. And then you could watch it for another hour. I think the only one who watched it, the full, like, come off was Chuck. Like, after the clouds opened up for the totality, you know, everyone just freaked out so much. It was like the culmination and everything, and everyone sort of stopped watching. But, I mean, the cool thing about it was is the eclipse only lasted an hour, and, every, you know, everyone just had a blast without it. Yeah. I could have done the whole thing without the eclipse and had just much fun. Yeah. It was really. Are we going to do it next year? We are going to do it next year, April 10th to 14th. We got uh, the bands and the comedians all said they'd love to come back. And uh, the property wants us back. So we'll try it again without the eclipse. So we'll make it longer this time. That was the other thing. Is everyone thought it was a little short. So this time it'll be easier for people to get there too. Yeah. yeah. Three nights for general admission and four nights for VIP. So, and yeah, it'll be way cheaper for people to get there. I mean, our flights were four times the price that I paid when it wasn't the eclipse. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, it went really well. So we decided we want to do it again and get the communities together. There's a ton of Americans there, which I never know how many Americans are going to be there, but I got to say, I was, you guys came out. I'm impressed with you as you came out in numbers. We held our own for sure. And there was a bunch of, what do they call the snake bros people? Snakes? There's a bunch of snakes there and uh, a bunch of uncharted Xers there. And then, I mean, I got to just give a shout. I do got to give a shout out to like uh, um, Utopia because we just had a bunch of listeners there randomly. I mean, I don't even know how it's possible that we have like a half dozen people listening to the show in a town of like 800 people. I know. That was really weird. Yeah. And Graham was on the tools. I was on the tools. Yeah. I went, yeah. I went shooting a little bit with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah, what you, you mean, right? Sasquatch. You didn't yeah. actually shoot Sasquatch, but I took a picture that made it look like you were. Actually, I didn't aim there once. So that my, was my last shot on there? Or did I can't remember. Yeah, now. you might have. I dumped yeah. a clip into him. It. It's pretty funny. We go to this little like range and this is on Bowman's property and, and uh, he's a super cool guy and, and uh, he's got a, like, he's like, sorry, but I, I got a, like, there's a metal Sasquatch, you know, target there. So, of course, Darren was happy with that. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with your shooting. Even though you oh, do yeah. this weird, you, I mean, you kind of learned how to shoot, right? You've learned how to shoot with both eyes open. Yeah, I don't have to do the blinky thing, yeah. Or the eye patch. Yeah, the eye patch, yeah. So I should be able to do it with a bow now, too, really, right? If I can do it with a rifle, yeah. I should be able to do it with a bow. I would say, I mean, you were hitting a six inch plate at, at, you know, 75 or 80 yards. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty decent. And I mean, dude, you were like, you were almost anti-gun like a few years ago. This is like quite the transition because right when you were on your way out the door, you were talking about just getting her down and going to get your, your gun license. Well, I feel like I've had, well, well, I'm not getting, I'm not going hard. I'm just going to make sure that I've. I'm capable, you know, I, I feel like it's just being capable. It's, and I know people say you should go out once a month to to practice and stuff, but 
But I think being capable, but you know what? It just, it just felt like I'd been doing it before. Maybe it's cause I had, you know, paintball and I was like, used to shoot a bow and arrow when I was younger all the time. Like maybe I just, you know, being a guy in the eighties and nineties, you know, like I probably just, I don't know. You know what I mean? Cap guns and Nerf guns. I was just like, nothing to it. I was fucking Played pro. Cowboys and Indians. I mean, it was like, this comes naturally to me. <laughs> guy shoots one fucking plate. <laughs> so I don't have to press. Just 80s guys could just shoot. <laughs> All right. Anyway, if people want to check that out. Um, we can put a link in the show notes. That's uh, it's gonna be a time. I mean, it really is gonna be a time. Um, there's day tickets if you want to go camp someplace else or get a hotel room. I mean, that's the other thing, is this time we'll be competing with all the eclipse traffic. So People can go get a hotel room on their own and just come out for the days if they want to do that or whatever they want to do. But and so we, it's also worth mentioning that we're not going to we're not we won't be doing the Utah event for a few years. We're going to try this instead. The Utah event hasn't been selling lately. So and like I say, I said to a couple people there, it really did feel like the the logical the next per, uh, transition. You know, it felt very natural to slip into that. Not quite a festival, not quite a conference, not quite a concert. You know, it's just felt like maybe that's where we were, we've kind of been headed. And uh, so it was fun. It was fun. I mean, it's like Oliver, what did fucking great at stand up comedy? I got to say, I was, I wasn't sure what to expect, but he was like an old pro. Yeah, and then you got to worry what kind of comedy you get in these days. But uh, there was no woke comedy. No, it was actually quite, quite the opposite. You were busting. You were I busting. was laughing really hard. Yeah, it was good. It made me want to go to comedy shows more often. It made me even start thinking about a bit to just to pull up a bit. Like I started making. Hey, we should notes. do one together next year. What? No, I don't know. I right, want to get up there with you. you just we had an open mic there. too, where people would get up, right? And next year we might have a karaoke night too, right? Yeah, I was just too tired to do the stand up. I will, you know, it was like an opportunity. Next year I'll do a, next year I will do uh some open mic. Because it has been an itch I would just like to scratch and see. I mean, I do almost have a little bit. I've got things that I always think of cuz you know, I, I even do little bits on the show now and again. Half, you know, half time you, they just go over your head. But, you know, sometimes I'll get an email from someone that's just like or you know what it is, sometimes you're even talking and I'll say it like real quiet under my breath. But uh, people catch it. And I catch it too. I just don't want to. I just don't want to. I'm not. I know I'm yeah. short and it goes over my head, but uh, I pick up. I'm not. You know, you just choose not to acknowledge it. So the event, right? So the link to that, it's not connected to our contact at the cabin yet. It's so on the Holocene one. I don't know how to connect it. So I've got a link in the show notes. I did find a connection to it. It's just, if you search, uh, like it's on eventbrite.com. Um, contact at the canyon you should be able to find it by a search or just go to the show notes and it'll be in there but it's not going to be through contact of the cabin until probably next week and then we'll, we'll and then we'll link it right uh can you do that oh yeah. to the website yeah. yes yeah. i will link it to the website yes it will be linked to the website uh i could probably do that because no andre should do that yeah yeah yeah, uh, yes, it will be linked on the website. That's right. Good point. Good catch. Uh, so come, come. You know, if it would be great if you guys came, and it would be great if you were coming if you got your tickets sooner than later. You know, it, it's only five hundred dollar event for the three nights. It's a great time, and if you get those tickets sooner, uh, it really does help things out around here. It, it, you know, there's nothing worse than going down to the wire wondering how many tickets you sell. You know, so it always helps if you're going to go get them. Speaking of which, we have a, a great event coming up in November in Canada. We'd like you guys to check out the uh, Invermere Hot Springs Adventure. That was a good one uh, last year. We had a great time with Brandon Powell up on the top of the mountain through two of Canada's most picturesque national parks. It really is a good time. Um, but come to event. I mean, the one thing we hear over and over and over again after these events is how, you know, people are crying. They're having a great time. You don't even realize how much you need to come to one of these things and hang out with people who think just like you, not just like you, but you know what I mean? 
you can just totally be free to be yourself in every regard of these things and be embraced for it. Which I really think is what makes it, that's really the most, it's not us, it's not the, all that, all the, 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 the entertainment entertainment helps and brings it together. But really the, the really big, biggest thing everyone has taken away from it is each other. Yeah. Oh yeah. That last day I had like so many great conversations with people, like long conversations, like half hour, an hour long, just amazing. Right. People that I would be like, if they were here, I'd be friends with them. Like, I'd be hanging out with them. If they were in my town, you know, we should, we should do an event here sometime and see if we could meet a bunch of cool Calgary. I mean, we know some pretty cool Calgary people. Yeah. That's some was, fucking weirdos too. There was one, there was one, um, there was one the other night. It was more of a political one. Like a bunch of people on X were meeting, but we were away at the, at the eclipse. And I was thinking you should go to that. You can might maybe meet some people like that are into the whole Canadian politics thing and all that, a little bit more. Cause yeah. we're doing this other show now on Grand America outlawed that we we're covering Canadian current events a little bit more. Cause there's so much going on and we need to cover it. Trudeau had to testify uh, testify today. <laughs> Actually, the one comedian, Darian, uh, crap, and now I got to say his last name, because um, he tracked me down on Instagram and he's following me. So maybe he'll listen to the show. If he has shout out to Darian, I was also, uh, I was pretty impressed with his comedy too. Yeah, they're funny. I think his name is just Darian Comedy on here. And the other guy's name was John Stokem. Stokem? I think that was it. Or Stolton. Stolton. John Stolton. And Owen, Owen, Owen Hunt, Hunt was there too. Owen Hunt was there. Did a little bit. Owen Hunt. Bootsy Greenwood. Yeah, he did great. It was really, uh, it was a great time. It was, it was fantastic. I had my little moped I was cruising around on. I'm a six shooter. So before we, before we forget, there is another event before all this. It's in, it's in May. Scablands with Randall Carlson. That's the, like the, the big event that, you know, the, the best event with, for the flood, the, you know, the catastrophic younger dries floods type stuff. So that's May 13th to the 18th. There's still a few tickets left, uh, but there won't be before too long. So, and then we have a zoom call with Randall as part of that. The whole group has a big zoom call with Randall and, and that's um, coming up in May. So check that out. That'll be at contact at the cabin.com too. It's easy to find. And the links yeah. for all that. I'm going to be there for that whole event. So it's going to be a good time. Me and the wife are going down for that. Yeah. I love Washington. The May one is is, is great too because everything's green. Yeah. There's a nice greenness to it. Also, support the show, grandamerica.ca slash support. Uh, we do want to, we need some support. Like I say, it's it's getting tough out there. It's getting hard out there. It's getting more. We just had more carbon tax come on. Our prime minister would had to testify today about some stuff. I think about not telling anyone about election interference. That's kind of <laughs> the amount of scandals that are coming to a head in Canada. Because uh, you thought I was going to say arrive can or SNC or something, right? But no, exactly. About, exactly. About something completely different. <laughs> Turns out that he knew a bunch more stuff about. Uh, and the, it's funny because I was listening to it, and uh, he's like trying to explain the difference between uh, election interference and election influence by foreign actors. And one course. is okay and one isn't. Of so course, okay. of course. <laughs> anyway, I digress. What, uh, I just had that support. I guess would, would, would paying like $17 billion to a consulting company, the, the number one consulting company in the world to, to push these sort of globalist policies, would that, would that be considered like election influencing <laughs> i don't know but i know we just paid like we just threw out two almost two billion dollars worth of expired covid vaccines today oh, and ordered man. more so where do, how do you get rid of that stuff i don't know you just throw it in the, in the ocean i'm sure in, but in the ocean. For two billion dollars you know that's about uh let me see that'd be about a six so uh, that's about two hundred dollars per per canadian household nice just into the ocean and that's okay. I'd rather than throw that away than do something useful. Yeah, I agree with that one. So I did want to say thank you to uh, Ray Howard for supporting the show. Sign up for a new monthly. Thanks, Ray. 40 bucks a month. I mean, God damn. Ray and Bowman and some people are stepping up fucking large lately to help, you know, noticeably help our 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 monthly 
revenue around here. We're into, I mean, we could use about 10 times what we've got to really get us back on track uh, to where we were before PayPal apocalypse and everything else. So, yeah, you can stop my my hunt for a part time job. Actually, if anybody know, has needs help with anything online, something I can do from home, let me know. What about like uh, will you talk people off for money? <laughs> <laughs> there might be a license or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> there might be. Yeah, I have my addiction certificate, but that probably oh. doesn't apply. I mean, like you know, talk dirty to them. Oh, it's, oh, talk. To, oh, that kind. Oh, I thought you meant like. No. I thought you meant like suicide hotline type stuff. What do you, what do you wear? <laughs> oh yeah, I can do that. Sure. Grandma, <laughs> take his clothes off on Zoom for money. Only fans. Please don't make him do it's that. My only, I mean, it's my only funds page. I've heard of uh, no such thing as bad publicity, but this could be the exception. Mm-hmm. America.ca slash support guys. Uh, we had another one time donation, fifty dollars. Do you have a note? Yeah, it's from Rick, Indiana. Hi, I'm a, Can- I'm a Canadian, now Texan. Oh, that sounds so good, eh? I can see myself wintering in Texas. I know, so it was wintering. Like, Jeez, oh yeah, I guess summer gets pretty hot, eh? But yeah, winter. Pretty hot. Yeah, yeah winter in the hill country. I mean, winter in the hill country would be cool. I would do, I would like And that. then Alberta in the summer? Yeah, well. That sounds all right, too. Yeah. That sounds all right to me. And I mean, been, maybe eventually you get used to the summers, but it sounds pretty hot down there. I'm going back in October to go fishing and uh, coastal duck hunting, which I'm pretty excited about. Nice. Yeah. So, so uh, it's on the ocean. So Rick and uh, Deanna have been listening for years now. Um, his monthly donator just made a one-time donation, 50 bucks. Thank you so much. And started listening to your audio books since you mentioned they are on Spotify now. You can mention me on the podcast if you like. I share some of your stuff with my wife and I'm convinced her that we need to attend a CAC. Keep up the great work. Rick, well, I mean, Texas is huge, so who knows? I mean, it could be it could be really far away from where we just were, but next year, Hill Country, next year in Utopia, maybe that's a good time, Rick, to come. Or in, if you want to come back to Canada in the winter and get some Canadian winter in. Yeah. You know, that one in November. And yeah. then always the Randall Carlson stuff is always... Uh, Fantastic. I mean, that Randall Carlson stuff is a is a higher price point, of course, but it's yeah. an all inclusive sort of thing. Randall ain't cheap. Randall and Brad Adventure is not. A, they're not a cheap duo. Oh, plus we're driving around like all day in vans with them, so it's it's even just gas and rentals and all that. It's that adds up. So I got a note here from deleted hundred thousand dollars to put on that event. What's that? It costs almost a hundred thousand dollars to put on that event. Yeah. Um, here's a, here's a couple of notes too. I'll read just from people. Um, oh, do, oh no. Do you have another one? Don't you have one from Paul? Uh, a donation from Paul uh, Jasper. He didn't leave a note. Yeah. Oh yeah. Maybe it was like $33 a ball or something. I can't remember. Uh, he sent us uh, 66 bucks us. So, which bought us lunch in, uh, Detroit. Yeah. So thanks Paul. I mean, we love you, buddy. You're one of our all time high supporters for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Paul. Hi, hi. It's been eight years now going on since I've listened to the show. Wow. That's uh, from, this is from deleted in our, in our, uh, in our gilded chat. I and believe that just popped in to drop that message and uh, get the fuck out. Oh, I thought maybe the account was made, made like, uh, the account made, was made, posted that message and then deleted. Oh, okay. And it's beyond words. Splendid gentlemen. I realize how much I seek you both in solace and find so much comfort in all you say and do. Honestly, I adore both of your voices like an old friend, friends, and I would not have made it through my nursing my third child, my girl in the boy world, two sons before daughter, without your podcast. The intro music is like my happy nanosecond of joy will come. (laughs) I want to make a donation commitment per month of $20, which I realize is not a lot. And so I wish I could do more. But if we could all donate that, we might see our favorite podcast go on. If 5% of you did that, you know, <laughs> we would be the equivalent of 100% of you given a dollar a month, which yeah. would which would, be, would put us both in the position to not have to worry about other work and, you know, yeah. do much more content, yeah. much more events, much more everything. Yeah. Much no, more no, online stripping for much less... 
chance that grandma will end up stripping online. Much less only funds. This is why you're losing weight. <laughs> My weight. <laughs> like if I have to transition to some more visible online stuff, I better get in shape. My wish is to keep this podcast alive and real. I want to camp with you guys. Please, someday, I will meet you both, and I know. You both, I know. My kindest regards, sincere heart. Please keep Grey America alive. Thank you both for all you do. Brandy Champion, Powhatan Tribe, Carbondale, Illinois. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah, thanks for the kind words. I mean, you guys really make it. It was, I mean, after an event like that and the some of the feedback we get, is, it's, uh, it's pretty humbling. Is pretty uh pretty crazy. Yeah. But thanks. And uh thanks for all the support. If you guys want to support, head over to grimerica.ca slash support, sign up for monthly or make a one time donation today. Of course, if you guys want to get into those audio books that Rick was it Rick. Yep. Was talking about that's addlebrain.ca and of course Grimerica Outlaw.ca is all those other all that other uh Canadian content and controversial stuff over there. You want to check that out and contact at the cabin for the trips. Anything else? Do you have a bio for, no, uh, but I got a, but I got a, I got a little, I got another email. I want to read. It's going to pop your humble oh, bumble, your humble humble bumble, bumble, bumble a little bit. I don't know if I have Here. a bubble. Um, Hey Graham, I'm a functioning, I'm the functioning alcoholic that messaged you earlier. I don't know if it's Darren or Darren, but he certainly raised some pretty good questions with your guests on the cosmic observations being all theory. So we're talking about the UFOs from, before the trip with Ron Janix. Ron Janix. <laughs> Darren almost bought, brought that chat to a halt. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of feedback on that one, actually. Like, <laughs> where the fuck you come from? <laughs> I just wish he bought, brought it to somebody who was versed with the theory, and he kind of made your guest look like a bit, like he didn't know what he was talking about, which I'm sure he did, but I think he was caught off guard and is certainly researching on his own to make sure this isn't happening again. I'm slightly annoyed at Darren, though, because he said it was dots on a screen. The discussion should have went to the Big Bang Theory. I'm just a high school teacher, but I do teach the two pieces of evidence of Big Bang Theory, which is compelling. The two arguments are redshift and background cosmic radiation. Redshift is easy to understand. The other one is a bit vague. But after teaching the particle zoo topic of analyzing antimatter subatomic particles in bubble chambers up in the sky, it could be all bullshit, but it's very intriguing. I don't care much about whether Darren made a fool out of your guest or not. I think it was rude, but that's a good thing sometimes. He should bring these arguments to a person that can argue about it. If he brings it up, he should say more than dots on the screen. Thank you for reading my emails. <laughs> and then I have yeah. I have another one. He, he says, and he wrote another one. He's like, sorry, I was a bit hyped, I guess. I'm a bit hyped, I guess. If Darren says the solar system observations are accurate, then... He could at least say those are all based off of light observations. It's the same thing. We observe light emitted from all objects around our solar system and deduce the different temperatures and elements that are present. If you want to say that the stars being theoretical suns, then he needs to go back at looking at the moon and sun, and that's it. Are there planets even? I have my own theories. Well, dude, there are moving objects in the sky, either by Earth rotation or orbits. Here is my own theory. Light travels in a straight line. If the light source is really far away, we receive a single beam of photons. The atmosphere absorbs light. Therefore, it will turn on and off. That's why the stars flicker. Still annoyed by Darren, but I guess he's doing way more than I am to contribute to the betterment of Earth. You're the, bad, you're the best podcast. So he even finishes it off on a nice positive note. I mean, I, I like that. I, I was caught off guard a bit by Darren because I expected Ron to be like, sort of already approaching these topics like Darren, the one Darren brought up. Like, I thought, oh, okay, here we go. This is going to be interesting. And I was like, oh, what's going on here? He's, it's like, is this the first time he's heard about this? <laughs> you know, I thought, well, maybe he's just been a little more mainstream ufo -y than I realized, you know? It's going to be super mainstream ufo -y. Because there's been a lot of stuff going around about the the moon, right? Did you see that that clip about the moon landing? Like the the interview process where... The guy, Michael Collins, the guy that was supposed to be doing the navigation from the stars, says, like, oh, I didn't see any stars while I was up there. And and uh, Buzz Aldrin yeah. gave him the look like, you know, the, this was like the super awkward 
that that should have been a, a a huge congratulatory like you know big celebration of hey we were just there and it was the most awkward press conference you've ever seen right after the they walked on the moon supposedly right i mean so that's going around i mean it's becoming pretty clear that there's some fuckery going on there with that so did you know his mom's name was moon no yeah moon collins his mom's maiden name was moon last she name moon? suicide right before he went to the moon no yeah wow that's pretty heavy and here I was crying at the, to the dark side of the moon at an eclipse. Yeah, well, I mean, I, they probably killed his mom to make sure that he knew how serious he, what he was getting into was because those motherfuckers didn't go to the moon. And, I mean, I love Randall, but I still think that everyone's missing that they think they can measure these planets that, as accurately as they think they can. I really think that that one day... Oh, we'll I figure know. out that those numbers are exact. They yeah, are I mean, for all intents and purposes, they are exact because they're building the fucking a what is it, twenty five or forty times tighter scale than I'm building shit to. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm building big stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And but I like the I like your theory how it's just it could be like m- numbers made up that are masonic and sacred in nature. You know exactly. That's probably you know that makes almost more likely. They'll just throw it off a little bit, so it's not. It can't be exactly that, Rick. Jesus Christ. Anyway, I digress again. What else? Uh, maybe I don't digress, but that's the word of the day. I feel like I've been listening to too much Micah Hanks lately, but I haven't yeah. listened to any. So this is a good one with uh, with Shane Simonson. He's he's about to get a, put a book out there called uh, "Taming the Apocalypse," and he's he's just doing his own experiments about about uh, growing crops and and different things and how much resources you can put in physically like is it worth your like if you were going to make this crop after the apocalypse like is it worth it like is is your time and effort worth it or is it even gonna is it you know gonna be a disaster so he's his release is coming out in a couple a couple months this book lays out the history that led humanity through the chaos at the start of the holocene to a radically new way of life agriculture and proposes that the only remaining sustainable resources after industrialization runs its course will be biology and culture Combined with climate change, the conditions have been set for a dramatic transformation of our relationship to the biosphere, one that is ripe with opportunities for an expansion of new domestications and adoption of low-tech biotechnology. In addition to this, he recently published a series of hard biological science fiction novels, Our Vitreous Womb, which imagine the consequences of such a transformation after another 30,000 years. This was published under a pen name, and you can read more at www.haldanebdoyle.com. There's links in the show notes to all this. I'm an experimental farmer from Australia who is working to assemble a range of future-proof crops, including like, I mean, that would be disaster-proof or apocalypse-proof, including staple and tree crops that can support human societies long after industrial inputs are no longer available. I blog about this work weekly at zeroinputagriculture.substack.com. And he also co-hosts the Going to Seed podcast where he gets to talk to amateur crop breeders from around the world. So there you have it. And he's, it was fun because he's listening to the show. He knows about some of our past uh, guests and podcasts with... Um, the hybrid guy. What's his name again, Darren? You always remember. The, Eugene McCarthy. Eugene McCarthy. We kind of talk about that too. It's fun. It was a fun one. It was a fun one. And I wasn't really even trying to fight with Ron Janix, you know? No, I, no, not at all. No, I just no. wasn't expecting him to have that stance. Mm-hmm. Or... You know, so it but almost put me in a weird piss situation. I know. I was, and I was about to go, well, you, you think science is a consensus? Like I was about to step on that one. I was like, Dude, I don't really want to go there with that, but. Yeah. So it was yeah. almost happened accidentally. I figured out just like switching gears. He's like, wait, what? <laughs> you don't fucking believe in the scientists? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Ron, I don't. Anyway. <laughs> Enjoy the chat. Well, this is this is this is the thing where the government's been lying to you for eighty years about UFOs, and you believe them about all this other stuff. So everything else. Okay. <laughs> anyway, guys, we love you. Uh, support the show, and more than anything, enjoy the chat with Dr. Shane Simonson.
All right. We've got another great guest from all the way down under with us, Shane Simonson. Thanks for joining us, Shane. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for the opportunity to come and say hi. You're welcome. Oh, this will be fantastic. I, I mean, I, I love the sound of your of your book and your Substack and and the stuff you're doing there uh, in your in your farming. And Darren, you know, Darren's just moved to a pretty sort of pretty big property. Not that he has like full access, but he's got you know. It's just interesting now that you know Darren's kind of found his place on a big, acre, you know, not too big, but an acreage. So I mean, I'm I'm just interested, and I've moved into a new place. So I'm interested to to hear a little bit more about that kind of like, you know, taming the apocalypse, like your book. But then we're also going to get into like other bigger picture stuff as well. So brilliant, yeah. I, I we, this can go in so many different directions. So so let's see what we um what we run into. Where where do you want to start? Do you want to start with like your specific work, or do you want to talk about like, you know, the start of agriculture and and uh, some you mentioned in in your email. And Darren will love this because this is one of Darren's favorite topics. And I don't think he knows that this is going to come up, but um, uh, Eugene McCarty, McCarty, Eugene McCarty, McCarty. McCarty. Yeah. McCarty. yeah, the the hybridism, because you're kind of involved in this stuff a little bit. So, I mean, do, do you want, where do you want to start? So I'm more on the plant side of yeah. the, the hybridization, speciation, domestication side of things. And it's a lot less controversial there because it's observed to happen both in uh, human controlled systems in, in agriculture and horticulture, um, but it's very well established that it happens in nature as well too, that many, many plant groups uh, regularly create new species through hybridization. Right. So why would that not apply to other ones then? Uh, well, with animals, it's there are examples that are definitely proven um so uh, there's a uh, liger uh, yeah no, no, not just like a, a an individual example of a cross but a whole new functional species in the ecosystem appearing so a really good example of that recently um so there's invasive honeysuckle in the united states and a fly suddenly appeared in people's field observations that was feeding on the fruits of the honeysuckle so they're like where did this thing come from like how did we not see it before doesn't come from where honeysuckle originally came from. It just popped out of nowhere. So they studied the genetics of it and found that it was a hybrid of two other fly species that feed on other fruits. And they managed to recreate that hybridization in the lab and then stabilize it to something equivalent to what they see in the wild. Um, even with Darwin's finches recently, one of them got blown from one island to another where there were none of its... Um, con specifics for mating with so it shacked up with a different species of darwin's finches and produced a hybrid offspring that started breeding amongst themselves you know no way Adam and eve style garden of eden don't ask too many story questions wow. um but they managed to stabilize into a small unique population wow in darwin that's awesome that it happens right in darwin's backyard there i mean yeah. that should that should have um, ruffled some feathers and Pardon. I believe that there's hybridization of coyotes that have stabilized into a new population in the US. And it's just, it, it's the kind of thing that when it's happening, nobody notices it. And then suddenly the population's there and people just shrug and say, you know, it's just, it's just always been there. Well, how does this happen in the fly example with, with like with a new flower or the, or you mentioned the, the honeysuckle thing, like all, how did they, so did it, was I it. I want to explain the birds and the bees to you, Graham. <laughs> Um, so with complex organisms, that. as long as you can get past all of the behavioral and genetic barriers, yeah. then anything's possible. You just need penetration. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? but I mean, that's what boils down to at the end of the day. And then it has to take seed, I guess. And then there's the difference between whether it's viable or not. But, yeah. but was there a need like, like, was for that? Uh, well, see, here's the thing. So... What it's this is a theory that I'm coming up with. Hybridization probably happens a lot more often than we realize, but usually the hybrid offspring doesn't have a viable niche in the ecosystem and it's competing against two very well defined, very finely tuned species that monopolized all of the resources that it could potentially tap into. That's so, fascinating. So usually they'll back cross to one of those parent populations and you, it, it creates a bit of a connection between the two species, but the evidence gets disappeared really quickly. It's wow. only when you have massive um, environmental catastrophe, like everything's up in the air and changing, that those hybrids have an opportunity to latch onto a new niche 
Or so like fly, the honey fuck any other fly probably when it's like mating time, you know what I mean? They could probably yeah. barely even see what's going on. Yeah, well, uh, they usually use pheromones, but again, it's all <laughs> up to preferences and who's available at the moment. That's, uh, uh, I think it's the equivalent of being, uh, what do they call it, prison gay? <laughs> if there's only flies of another species around or birds of another species around, you're more likely to just, you know, give it a go and see what but, happens. But the niche the was the honeysuckle, right? Wasn't the niche the honeysuckle, though? Yeah, so in that example, that was the new niche that was being unexploited and once these two species hybridized, that highly mixed up genetic diversity of the hybrid population had an opportunity to refine itself towards uh, using that new resource. So what came first, though? Like the, the invasive honeysuckle or the hybrid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what came, first? came into, into the region first. And it yeah. probably was invasive because it didn't have species like the new fly. Oh, so but I mean, where's the, it's so fascinating because this kind of... I don't really think this fits in with evolution, but there was a trigger or like a morphic resonance. Like I, it almost fits in with Sheldrake's thing that there's a new, there's a new invasive species of something and it needs something to tame it. Um, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because there's a pattern in particularly invasive plants. Often they're introduced into a region and they just sit around doing nothing for hundreds of years. Um, they, they're just, you know, they've, they've, escaped into the wild and there's a few of them around in a limited location and people are like, and if you look around the ecosystem, there's like thousands of introduced species like this, just sitting there practically doing nothing. And then suddenly something happens and then they explode and spread everywhere. And often these explosive um, processes are a result of hybridization of two distinct strains within that one species as defined by science. So, for example, um, you see this in agriculture all the time, and this is what we talk about a lot with the land race gardening uh, podcast, uh, Going to Seed. Um, I can take two distinct strains of pumpkins and you can you can get away with growing them and they, they do okay, but when you hybridize them and allow them to mix up their genes from that early hybrid, hybrid population, you get this explosion of diversity and you can apply selective pressures and end up with a, a far superior variety for your local conditions. And this seems to happen with introduced wild weedy plants as well too, that you'll get one introduction that like can barely hang on in a really limited region. And then a second introduction comes in and the two of them collide. And that's when you get the explosion into an invasive species. And something similar to this happened in Australia. I mean, we've got so many weedy species here, but our lantana, is this huge, shrubby, spiky, beautifully flowered thing that loves growing in the understory of when you log down a rainforest. So we've got vast acreages covered with this thing. But the variety of lantana that we have here doesn't exist in South America where the parent species came from. It's actually a hybrid of three or four um, almost sterile ornamental varieties that managed to like barely get their pollen into each other when they were growing in the garden together, produce a few fruits, that the birds then started spreading into the um, into the forests, and um, yeah, if you look at the history of agriculture, pretty much every crop and most livestock has a hybrid origin. When you go back to where it was first domesticated, wow, Darren, do you got any comments or questions? You were, I kind of well, I think it. it's a combination of all of those things. You know, hybridization, evolution, and uh, the other one. I forget what the other one is now, but we were just talking about talking about it. You know, I think it's all three. Why Morphic not? Residence or? Yeah. Morphic yeah. Residence. Yeah. It's all three and probably the, and then some, probably some extra shit mixed in there too. So that's Sweet. my, my take on it. I mean, I, you still won't convince me that we're not from pig or monkeys fucking pigs. So I, that's where all the evidence seems to point. Well, I, I find McCarthy's work to be absolutely fascinating. I've reached out to him, but I haven't heard a, a response yet. I think he's, anyway, I'm guessing that he's had a lot of pushback and criticism and he's just over it. So he stopped putting his head out into public, which I understand. Um, I'm open-minded about the hypothesis. And I think he is too. If you read closely his work, he isn't advocating this. He isn't arguing it is true. He is saying it is a hypothesis worth investigating. And that's a, a distinction the that culture has a hard time dealing with. To me, that is more plausible than because it's either that or they like 
The other thing is they maybe they mixed up some monkeys and some pigs, some aliens did that. Maybe it was the Anunnaki. They made us to make some slave some gold or whatever the fuck. I don't, you know, that to me sounds nuts compared to just like I've seen videos because I've been going off about this for almost a decade now. And so now people just send me like a video of a a chimp or a little bonobo just pounding on a little baby pig. And, uh, you know, is that viable? Maybe it's viable. I don't know. If they know, they ain't telling us. I mean, there's you hear the rumors of the pig man or this, that. I mean, even Seinfeld had a play on the pig man. But uh, it's one of the limitations of our scientific model. So um our scientific theories and our, our methods and our culture came from physics and chemistry, where the idea was that something needed to be reproducible in a laboratory. So if you take the same ingredients or the same, you know, proton beam or something and set it up the right way, you'll get exactly the same results. And biology doesn't play like that. So if you have a situation like a monkey pig hybrid, where it's only one in a million embryos is actually viable then you can't necessarily just reproduce that in a laboratory unless you can reach the necessary scale to, you know, have that lucky event. So in in biology, because once you have one thing succeed, it can reproduce itself. It means that it opens the doors to something that functions like a miracle, that it happened just once. And it's not easy to just make it happen again, but the consequences propagate from that point forward. Right. So you don't need them. You, the, you could have it happen 99 times and, you know, the offspring aren't viable, but then all of a sudden it gets the mixture right, you know, a, 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 a congress of apes stumbles across a, a herd of wild pigs and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And all of a sudden a bunch of pigs have, you know, I don't know, because you got to get a few of them going in the beginning to to get the species going, but. You know, even the Bible says just two. So maybe just two. Maybe it's twins, a boy and a girl. Holy shit. What happened, what happened there? The pen stays in the pen? <laughs> well, I well, mean, I don't see, think they had pens. But, the, this is know, the interesting thing, though. So nor- <laughs> normally, hybridization leading to new species in nature relies on catastrophe of like opening or, or massive changes in the ecosystem to, that open up new niches. So most of the time you end up in a relatively static state in terms of speciation and you just get these occasional punctuated equilibriums where suddenly everything changes. Human culture has the capacity to both create and nurture these hopeful monsters. So when you first hybridize something, you just don't get instant success. Often the first few generations are a step backwards in terms of vigor compared to the parent species. But if you... Uh, if you nurture them through that difficult adolescence into something new, then it opens up all sorts of possibilities and you don't have to wait for an asteroid to hit the planet in order to get major spatiation events. You wow. can do it within, you know, the the protection of humanity that understands and values this process. Wow. Well, there's you- a lot of evidence of asteroids too. So, I mean, that boat, that isn't like a, 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 uh, if anything, that would almost make it more plausible than ruining it for me. It's like, okay, well, we talk to people all the time that say asteroids are hitting this bitch all the time, or the sun's going off and torching the place. I mean, it honestly seems like a pretty terrible place to live sometimes when it's it, not it's, great. It's just terrible enough to make it interesting. <laughs> that's the way and i look make, at it and, and to make you dig some tunnels so that maybe you have somewhere to go and when the shit pops off i mean i i almost think that they're they were hiding in tunnels and under under the earth for you know, there's actually a few sci-fi you'd like this because you write fiction too yeah yeah um there's some really cool sci-fi theories about like all the planets that that, that mainly it's it's just uh, normal that it's all inside the planet, you know, under tunnels and catacombs and stuff. And it's rare that things evolve on the outside because of the hazards of the the outside world, you know. Well, on that topic, on my Substack a while ago, I did a post called the Dim- the diminishing returns of collapse, and I actually looked at all of the mass extinction events through history and also collapses in human civilization and made the argument that the whole system is getting better at enduring and recovering from these disasters 
if you actually look at the early mass extinctions and the early civilization collapses, they're much more severe and take longer to come back from than the more recent ones. And it makes sense. Like if you keep hitting a complex system with the same stress, eventually it's going to find ways of adapting to it. Right. And th this idea that we have to be a multi-planetary species in order to deal with these things is complete rubbish. Like the middle of Antarctica is more hospitable on the day that an asteroid has hit the planet than the surface of Mars is on a good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you've, but, you've still got a magnetic field, you've still got a breathable atmosphere, you've still got gravity around about the right level. Did so, your analysis did your analysis of, of collapses and catastrophes include pole shifts at all? Like how, what about that? If that if that's a thing that actually does happen, because I'm not sure if that's sort of a real thing or not, but people say that the the, the magnetic pole is slipping right now as it is. Like, yeah, they're, they're an interesting kind of intermediate case. So asteroid collisions and m huge volcanic events leave big signatures in the like hundreds of millions of years range. And in the thousands of years range, we've got uh, you know uh, archaeological and occasionally written evidence of what civilization collapses were. But the pole shifts are something that's kind of an intermediate timescale. And the evidence for that isn't as good. Um, you do have some cases of, um, I remember seeing uh, microfossils showing high levels of mutation in uh, plants at the time, like their pollen was getting all janked up. And um, that was probably from higher UV levels during a pole shift or, or some other um, impact that, that messed up the atmosphere and, and stripped off the ozone layer. Wow. So, so yeah. Maybe before we get into that, I, I want to ask a question before I forget to ask it, but about the hybridization of the plants. And so what you do then with the plants, like I've, I don't really know how this works, but is, do you do the same thing as nature does or how close is your process to nature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I work on a, a bit of context. So I'm in Australia. I'm a bit of a doomer. I think that the oil powered industrial system that we have is running on empty and it's going to contract and simplify. And I think as as time has gone by, the devil's in the details about how you think that's going to play out. And nobody has a real idea. Um, but I think most people are coming onto that feeling that we, we feel like we're at the top of a roller coaster, that sick feeling before the plunge starts. Um, who knows what that plunge is going to be like. But in Australia, we went from hunter gatherer culture to industrial agriculture with nothing in between. Right. We don't have a history of pre industrial agriculture that, you know, fed civilization for thousands would of years the, would that be the same as us then too uh you're probably similar yeah depending on where you are in canada um so my challenge is assembling a range of biological resources that could support a post-industrial civilization in my particular bioregion because at this time in history it's relatively easy to find and collect those resources like we've got a a global information system, postage system, and communication system that has never happened before. And it's the biggest, most complicated machine that we've ever made. And there's already signs of it falling apart at the margins. So I figured that's the thing I can do in my time in history that in another 20, 30, 100 years may not be as easy for people to do. So I'm doing it now while I can and um, trying to find what actually wants to grow in my particular location without all sorts of industrial inputs to keep it going and productive. Yeah, that gets into the whole topic. I want to ask you about your in zero input, you know, what yes. that means. But but let's get back to the hybridization. To the hybridization. Part. So yeah. there's a spectrum. At one end, you just take established strains of an already domesticated crop and you do a variety trial to figure out the ones that like your conditions and then you allow them to mix and you go through, you start the selection process for them thriving in your local conditions. But at the other extreme, I've got some novel domestication projects as well. So a good example of this is um, we have a local uh, conifer tree called the bunya nut. And it's this amazing thing from the Jurassic. It gets uh, cones on it the size of basketballs covered in these giant spines. And they're full of chestnut-like seeds that are full of starch. So the local Indigenous people used to have giant feasts, like eating these things. Um, but I'm looking at them thinking, could they be domesticated? Um, so I've brought in, I, I, I've assembled um, a diversity of the local bunya nuts that grow all around me. But I've also brought in another species from South America from when Gondwana land was all connected. 
um, called the Piranha Pine, and it comes from southern Brazil, which has a very similar climate to us. So my life's work in the you know, 20 good years that I've got left on the farm is to mature these two species and do a mass hybridization between them and then take those hybrid seeds and send them all over the world because they have the potential to grow everywhere from the tropics down to probably about zone seven. And there's a cold tolerant species from Chile, the monkey puzzle, which I think can push the hybrid swarm down to about zone five. And this species is, it, it's got so much potential to be like a major tree staple crop that can be integrated with livestock at the same time. Wow. Yeah. 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 So how does that, does that physically happen? Like you physically are splicing these things together and then how does nature do it then? Um, it's just, it's just hybridization. So they're wind pollinated and yeah. I'm really, really lucky because the piranha pines have separate male and female trees. So when they start maturing, I'm going to be killing all of the male piranha pines and just leaving the females in amongst all of the bunyas. So the seeds coming off the female piranha pines have to be hybrids. I'm setting up the conditions where hybridization has to happen. Wow. Okay. Interesting. And, and, and nature just does that sort of naturally. Yeah. 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 But humans can be a catalyst in that process. We can be a symbiont to shape the ecosystem. And I mean, this was happening all around the planet before industrialization. So the, the forest gardens of Eastern U.S., had extensive interventions from the indigenous Indian people. Yeah. They were selecting and moving and thinning um, tree crops all over that region for thousands of years. Right, right. It's, and similar yeah, things happening in Australia. World, right? Really, I yeah, mean, all over the world. the world. Like at, at some point, yeah. So then, man, there's so many questions I have. But maybe maybe we'll stick to the young, like the cataclysm part and the younger dryest before we get more into the zero input stuff. But mm. so I look. I love what you put there about, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you, you look at the, you know, the chaos that happened after that Holocene to the, to this radical new way of life, this agriculture, mm. um, that the only, the only remainable sustainable resources after industrialization runs its course, it will be biology and culture. So do you, do you want to expand on that a bit more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the civilizations that rose up after that Holocene chaos, they were built on accidental biotechnology. So wheat, for example, is a three-way hybrid of these wild grasses that have dust-like seeds, like tiny, tiny little seeds that people were harvesting and eating them, but it was a huge amount of work for not much payoff. And by cramming those three genomes together, you create a crop which suddenly has so much of a return that it's worth transforming the whole landscape to grow it. And everything that came after that, the metallurgy, the, the giant monuments, literacy, government, religion, all of that was built on that one accidental biological happenstance. So my idea is that going forward, we're likely to have a, another period of climate chaos. Um, the CO2 levels are going up, which is going to change the rate at which different plants grow again. And I look at the next thousand does years. Does it slow any plants down or does it speed them all up? Like, is there plants uh, that more CO2 is bad for? So grasses are low carbon dioxide specialists. So in, in the lead up to the Holocene, Earth actually hit the lowest CO2 levels that it had ever had. And that was probably part of the contribution to the extinction of the megafauna that a lot of the tundra just stopped growing because the CO2 got so low, um, even in places that were still relatively warm. And coming out of that with the CO2 levels going back up again, grasses had an advantage um, in terms of being more productive because they had all of these mechanisms to use CO2 more efficiently. I suspect that the next jump in CO2 levels is probably going to open up broadleaf plants, um, including tree crops and perennial crops that were always around the margins, but I think they're going to become more useful in the next few thousand years and the grasses will lose their relative competitive advantage. So does that mean we could see the like the forestation of the prairies and the grasslands? I mean, the prairies are really just the grasslands. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because a lot of those functional grasslands rely on uh, large animals moving around in huge herds to maintain them. And we've broken that system. Like we've killed off most of the megafauna uh, over most of the world. And that happened before industrialization and before civilization often. Um and now our modern management system relies on putting fences everywhere and like water lines. And it, it's a really brittle system that relies on inputs that aren't going to be around for that much longer. 
So how those about, systems evolve but in the future? You guys are really like, you guys. Sorry, but you, sorry to interrupt. You guys are huge on cattle, though. That stuff I feel like is gonna just do fine. Uh, it, it'll probably remain a viable enterprise, but how we manage it is going to have to change when we don't have fences. Like it, a lot of the Great Plains of the US was only colonized after barbed wire fencing became cheap enough that you could put a line around a property and keep your livestock in. Um, before that time, that was kind of the, the early Wild West stage. You could ranch cattle, but you had to basically just follow them around the landscape and try and like nudge them in the direction of a market to get a, a payoff in the end. So that, that transformation in how the landscape was used is really, really interesting. Um, I, I'm hopeful that if we can get our act together that we can domesticate a wider range of large animals to create mixed species herds to manage the landscape more effectively than just having cows wow as seen on the tv show 1885 or was it 1883 i can never get that right have you seen that uh no 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 tell me about it oh yeah they show well they show a great example of the the trek out west and the cowboys bringing rat like going out and getting the um um a herd to follow the the convoy out west. You know, it's it's all about all about that. And they mention the barbed wire. They mention the fencing. Yeah, it completely changing. changed the like, culture. It's all changing because of the fencing. Now we have all this fencing, and it's all changing. Like everybody's sort of getting their, a, their property. It, it's comparable to the enclosures of the common agricultural land that happened in Europe around the same time, that was mostly driven by cheaper metal, making it possible to have horse-drawn combines. So you didn't have to have all of these peasants waiting around for most of the year to harvest all of the grain. You could do it with a machine and you're like, go away, peasants. I don't need you anymore. Huh. That's fascinating. But yeah, so, so much of all of that transformation is all dependent on having greater quantities of cheaper iron um, up until that point, you could make iron tools with wood and charcoal, but the growth rate of forests limited the amount of technology that you could have in society because there just wasn't enough metal to do it. Like a, a peasant would have, you know, an axe and a metal pot and a knife and a few nails and, and fasteners. And that was it. Like that was a lifetime supply of iron was all that the ecosystem could supply. But once coal became adapted for creating more iron, you had this explosion in cheap iron. And everything else that's happened after that has still been built on a foundation of cheap iron. And um, most of the world's good quality surface, easy to access coal resources have been used. Um, I saw a really good argument that the shift of industrial production to China was partially driven by them having the last large high quality coal resource left in Inner Mongolia that they hooked up to their system with rail lines that got sent out there relatively recently. And it's starting to show signs of stress in terms of the rate at which the coal can come out of it. Huh, that's interesting. Do you ever think about why, why we're so, uh, why wheat is not really healthy for us? Like if it's been around for so long, if it's one of the earlier things from that last sort of change after the cataclysm, why is it, is it just the chemicals or like, I, cause I always wonder like, if that's such an old thing and, we, and we've been doing it for, we've been eating it for so long, it's made such a difference in us. Why isn't it, why do I have to fucking watch the bread that I, you know, like. So part, this is like such a multi-layered problem, but so going way back. So um, when you look, so there's genetic markers for your risk of gluten intolerance, for example, right, and yep. like full celiac disease is deadly. Like you die in childhood. And if you look at the genetic markers of early humans in the Middle East, they had the same rate of susceptibility to celiac disease as uh, people who've never eaten wheat traditionally. But it, as time went by and more and more wheat cultivation happened, those genes got weeded out of the population. Those children just didn't survive being fed nothing but bread for the first 12 years of their life. And it's when you get out to the outer edge of Europe, so Ireland and Scandinavia oh. is where you get the highest rates of those genes because wheat arrived there last. Right. So there's this We're adaptation process. Out. We're still weeding them out. Yeah. And it goes even further back. I mean, like farmers, the early farmers increased the rate of amylase, the gene that allows you to digest more starch compared to hunter gatherers. And if you go to the Inuit or the Maasai who eat almost no starch, they've got like one or two copies of that gene. If you go to Southeast Asia with like rice paddy people, they have 17 copies of that gene. And 
that kind of mutation can happen relatively quickly in a population that's under this constant metabolic pressure. And it makes wow. you wonder if humans still have capacity to adapt to, to new crops that are otherwise, you know, semi-edible today. Yeah, I mean, yeah. look at this. If we ate nothing but Twinkies and Ho-Hos for another 10,000 years, the people who tended to become obese and get diabetes and, you know, have all of these problems would be weeded out of the population over time if we didn't have, like, modern medicine propping them up. Yeah, that's fascinating because I did hear about that, that the stomach, our stomachs, the bio... The, the biome of our t uh, stomachs is different. Like for Northern Europeans, for example, they can handle carbs differently than mm -hmm. those simple carbs differently. And, and the, the starches, I guess, compared to other, other people. Yeah. There's another weird example of that. Japanese people who eat a lot of seaweed, there's yeah. a microbe in their stomach that breaks down one of the carbohydrates from the seaweed. And it borrowed that gene from a uh, organism that lives in the ocean. Yeah, that's fascinating. So there's all these different levels that you can like adapt to completely different situations. And humans are like more adaptable than, well, modern humans are more adaptable in that way than any other creature that's turned up on the planet before. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a bit of a game changer. And I mean, that's happened before in history. Like the first plants that pumped out oxygen completely changed the chemical composition of the whole atmosphere. And the trilobites, when they first evolved, were the first species with cutting jaws and armored skeletons and there were all of these like weird blobby jelly type organisms that were starting to form bodies and that when the trilobites emerged they just ate like 90 percent of those early families and wiped them out and we have no idea what they were we've just got these weird impressions in the mud is that the, the part of that cambrian explosion type thing yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 it was one of the first big um parts of the cambrian explosion they were the first segmented creatures that took over the uh, the whole oceans basically overnight so and then wasn't he, there a big wasn't there a big shift or gap after that then? Um, so it's weird. Like I look at the trilobites as being like the beta max of that body plan, and then all of these other creatures that independently evolved, like the the insects and the crustaceans, came up with similar solutions and eventually took over from the trilobites. So I wonder if humans are going to be a similar thing. Like we, our emergence probably relied on the state of the whole planet. Like this record low CO2 put the whole ecosystem into a kind of weird crisis state and then humans emerged with this whole new set of behavioral adaptations and then went on a rampage. Um, I, I see us as more as a catalyst, like a transformative agent. Um, and you could almost view industrial civilization like a detritivore, like where... Um, so a really good comparison is when plants first evolved the ability to form wood, like lignin and cellulose, and make huge bodies, it took about 10 million years for fungi to catch up and figure out how to break down this new substance. And for those 10 million years, there's just dead trees lying all over the planet. The CO2 levels plummeted and we had another like ice age and all of the coal beds that we have today were formed. So when fungi first appeared as detritivores, they like re-liberated all of that CO2 into circulation and like rebalanced the planet. And I almost wonder if humans are serving a similar oh. role in industrial civilization as this big bloom of a, a fermentation to like put things back into motion that have been locked up for, for tens of millions of years. There's <laughs> too much carbon <laughs> dioxide, Shane. Haven't you got the memo? I'm paying tax on carbon because <laughs> there's too much. Well, so. here's the thing, like, I'm not that worried about the temperature implications of rising CO2. The far more interesting thing is that different plants photosynthesize at different rates depending on the CO2 level. And grasses have dominated the planets for so long because the CO2 level was so low for so long. With it rising again, you've got deserts that are turning back into scrublands, like all of these shrubs are springing up in places that used to be too dry. They are still too dry. But what's changed is higher CO2 levels allow plants to use water more efficiently if they've got broad leaves. So it, it's ecosystems are just changing all over the place in all of these chaotic ways. And it's this invisible creeping thing where individual species hit thresholds of suddenly being more competitive one at a time. And there's no telling what's going to happen next. I suspect a lot of the woody um, invasives that are spreading through the US at the moment are suddenly taking off for this reason, that they've hit a key level of CO2 that allows them to, them to compete in a way that they couldn't before. 
What do you think about the, the abiotic oil theory? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's true, but it's not just the amount of oil and where it comes from, but the rate at which it can flow into industrial civilization. Yeah. Um, it, it's not the tank, it's the tap. So, um, and also how far away that, that resource is as well too. So if there is abiotic oil, it's probably so deep and it comes to the surface so slowly that I can't see it making a difference to the the level of complexity that we've built with such a rapid increase in the rate at which we consume things. Right, right. So when do you think peak oil is? You must be a peak oil guy then. I am, I am. I I think we're around about it now. Um, It's funny, like I kind of got set onto this uh, path back in the early 2000s when we led up to the GFC with that huge spike in oil prices and all of the community that had been talking about this issue that I was like participating in, theoildrum.com was like where all of the nerds went back then. Um, there were a lot of people like screaming that, you know, the whole system's gonna like blow up and, you know, just disappear overnight. But there was a smaller, quieter crowd saying, no, it's probably gonna be a low, long, slow, drawn out process. And I think they're proven to be right. That there, there is likely to be periodic disasters and like stair step simplifications. Um, I mean, look at Lebanon, for example, recently, or Sri Lanka. These are small peripheral parts of the industrial, you know, ecosystem that reach the point of being non-profitable, and they just got cut off. Like, they basically just got abandoned. And I wouldn't be surprised if Australia is in a similar position, that we're so far away from everyone else that we're going to be one of the first ones that's just like, it's not worth sending tankers to Australia anymore. So we'll just keep doing industrialization in North America and just pretend that Australia doesn't exist. Um, Haiti is a great example too. You guys, like it's right on your doorstep. Well, I mean, at some point, you just gotta leave leave the locals to the local stuff. You know, I mean, it's just it's none of my business. As long as I got a high enough wall, then it's none of my business. I mean, I don't know that it's it's. What do we do about Haiti? And, you know, is it is it our problem? Do we go in there as, as the whites and be like, all right, boys, knock it off? Well, see, this is the way I imagine the industrial corporate global system functions. It looks at somewhere like Haiti and says, are there enough resources here to be worth investing in getting it under control and extracting them? And the last big wave of intervention in Haiti was basically parasitic. They were just stripping the country of the last things that they could grab and get out of there. And it's basically uh, a, a dead zone at the moment. And I don't agree with us doing that kind of stuff, this economic hick man, this resources. I mean, we've got so many natural resources in Canada that we could all be millionaires. Every Canadian could be a millionaire. We could be like Saudi princes, but we can't get, we can't get our shit together. But, you know, some of these places, when we're there fucking them up, seems to be you know, when the only time it's not totally fucked and, you know, I don't know what we can do about that other than, you know, at some point we just gotta, we gotta walk away. It seems crazy to me to have someplace. I mean, we're sitting on top of so much oil here. We can't figure out a way to get it to market fast enough. So I just, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, it's so far, we've got a refinery two hours away running out of energy is just not on my radar. Do you think if anything, I could see more where we just stop and you can already see sort of the, things in place you can see you can see the sort of where it's where the pipelines are going to get built to eastern canada and to western canada because eventually in my lifetime we're going to be burning canadian oil all over all over this motherfucker and we're going to be proud to do it and it's going to be weird but i don't see how how we do it any other way so do you think this like well i mean we're lucky in a lot of senses because we're sitting on top of oil And on top of, you know, I'm in Wheatland County. So, I mean, even obviously a lot of this extra weed is because they're pumping chemicals and this and that. But 95% of the people are going to die. So I can survive on 5% of the wheat. And uh, hopefully some of the animals will come back. I mean, we're we're still pretty blessed in how much wildlife is running around here. I, I still don't. I think I could eke out a living on that. I feel like Australia is the same way. In a lot of ways, but I never consider that you guys don't have any energy. I mean, that that would be a real concern that you guys could get shut off on energy because it can't be. How much is it is, is gas there? Is it per liter there? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's relatively expensive um, compared to the US, but I mean, that's everywhere outside well, of like Kuwait and petrol estates. Um, so Australia has a lot of coal. Um, we're starting to frack gas, which is keeping our local gas relatively cheap, but we're exporting most of it at like bargain basement prices because we're, we're a, um, a, a resource extraction colony of the. So you can system. turn that frack and stuff into gasoline. In theory, but Do we you can't have even... any refineries. You yeah, must have. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an outline of uh, where we are in Australia. So we produce about half of the oil that we consume, but it's mostly light fractions. So all of that gets sent to Singapore. We've shut down all of our refineries to get refined in Singapore. It's blended with heavier oil from like the Middle East and Indonesia. And then it comes back to us as finished product. So if we lose our shipping connection to Singapore or Singapore goes offline, our ability to create you know, fuel to like move trucking around is basically gone overnight. And we recently oh. bought a strategic petroleum reserve, our, our government thought ahead, but it's in California. That's almost inevitable to happen in the next 10 years, maybe five. Yeah. I mean, you must be like, oh, well, we're just going to run out of gas soon. I mean, well, how can you not? The global shipping, just without anything else, I don't see how global shipping survives the decade. Well, it it relies on the United States Navy keeping the shipping lanes yeah. secure. I think that feels over. Yeah, that feels like it's it's got an expiration date. Um, I think what, like what all this comes red in, it, stuff yeah, and what comes in that, the aftermath, you know, is... Yeah, is like is the wavering of all that. It's sort of like the pullback because otherwise it's going to be, I mean, it seems like it's going back to East versus West is what it really seems like where like, do you, does it viable that you guys would maybe start getting your energy from someplace like Russia? Too far away, too far away. Yeah. And the, the biggest issue is if we were forced to produce our own oil, our own like fuels for, for vehicles, um, is that we would produce very, very little diesel, like the heavy fuel that powers machinery that does agriculture and trucking and all of those vital functions. So we might be able to keep people driving around the suburbs if we've got our the refineries operating again um, to a limited degree. But see, here's the thing that I'm predicting for the whole world is that we'll probably have a long tail of oil production that it'll decrease for a relatively long period of time. The difficulty is going to be how the economic system and the political system responds to that change, because the, particularly the, the, the financial system has been built around the mathematics of growth, the idea that you, you invest and you get a certain percentage back, and there's like little ups and downs along the way, but it's relatively predictable. Um, that doesn't look like it's going to be compatible with a decreasing resource base. And in some ways, the financialization of the economy, like creating all of this debt and all of these instruments for investment that aren't really connected to anything physical is probably a way to try and keep the mathematics working a bit longer. Um, I suspect region by region, there's going to be uh, an abandonment of that financial system, which will probably be accompanied by shifting to a more an attempt at a more authoritarian type of government style. Yeah, but places like here and there, it's just not going to happen. You know, like Australia can probably authoritize the cities, but it's going to have trouble every place else. There's exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the government needs that fuel to project its power into the hinterland, so that's and it's probably not going to be covered. worth it. You know, it's yeah. just not going to be worth the squeeze to go after the rednecks. Well, if you look at the history of civilizations going up and down, this is generally what happens. During the down phase, the centers of power concentrate on their productive hinterlands of keeping them under lock and key. But there'll be little tiny like mountain villages in a valley that's got a tiny pocket of fertile soil that end up relatively disconnected. And they have an opportunity to achieve some degree of independence. But if the bandits come knocking, they're on their own. So if they're too small to be viable to protect themselves, then they're possibly going to be wiped out. So, yeah, it's do you, do you want to live secure as a slave or do you want to live free as somebody who, like, sleeps with one eye open? Bring it on, man. I mean, I don't have to sleep with one eye open. Graham can stay up for a while. And then well, again, it's, it's about culture and critical mass. You, you need to have enough of a pocket of isolated fertile soil to have enough of a population to maintain some complexity and coherence and critical mass for defense. 
Do you ever think about leaving Australia and, or, or you guess you're from there. It's hard. Like I have my home field advantage here. Do you have like a favorite country? If you could just magically transport everything someplace without cutting all your ties, would you? And at do you this, have a time Yeah. At now? this stage in my life, it doesn't make sense. I mean, in theory, I could sell the farm that I have for like bank because it's, a huge property bubble here at the moment and go somewhere else and use the currency leverage to like live like a king. But I don't think I have enough years left on the clock to do anything with it other than sit around and get massages. And I, I don't <laughs> want, that's not my goal in life. I, I want to do something that has an interesting consequence. Like I want to be a catalyst for something bigger. <laughs> that's um, funny. If that's I was in Australia in my twenties, like trying to get established um, with how crazy the economy is at the moment i would definitely think about going somewhere else and i, I mean probably... just from a collapse perspective though just from like like the you know just like the lights are shutting off everything's broken where yeah is just like... economics and culture are, are dysfunctional here so yeah i could definitely see the incentive to do that i would probably try and pick a country that is poor that is relatively disconnected from the global system that like has never been that interesting i mean a really good example would be bhutan so it's up in the mountains. It's never been conquered. It has a really different way of doing governance. Um, and I'm not sure how willing they are for, like, you know, 20-year-old white people from Australia just turning up and saying, I want to live in Bhutan. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, what places are willing to accept people is a big issue as well. Um, I mean, there's a couple of pockets in South America, but... The general pattern there is volatility. There's island nations, but anyone with a boat can just turn up and, and make trouble for them. Um, Highland Africa has a few interesting little pockets. But again, like the cultural barriers, the older you get in life, like learning a language. And here's the thing. If you're, in a, if you're a recent immigrant to a different culture and it starts becoming stressed, usually what happens in a culture is that they look for scapegoats. and you're more likely to be among the people who are targeted to be the ones. To, yeah. And you know, if you can't speak the language very well or anything like that, then now you got real problems going on. You know, I could, mm -hmm. there's definitely something to home field advantage. I can't remember who said that, but we had a pass. You, you did. You did. Yeah. I don't think it was me. Yeah, it was you. You, you were talking about the home field advantage. Yeah. I think you, I stole you, it. you look at successful migration like that. And it's either one person who moves during a time of peace marries a local, has a family, and even another generation passes, so they become relatively indistinguishable from the local population. Right. I don't think we have that much time on the clock anymore. Yeah. The alternative is you have a critical mass of people move all together. Um, and, I mean, that happens a lot in history, but they tend to become a persecuted minority. So um, like if, you can find like some, if, if you can find something that you can offer the wider yeah. community that you can yeah. do that they value, you might have a chance. Yeah. But I mean, how many useful skills do people in the West have left that they can offer anymore? Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of useful skills. <laughs> DJs, $15. HJs, $10. Watch me touch it, $3. <laughs> I think, uh, well, you keep talking about not enough time. What's the timeline? And you're, I'd like to hear your timeline. You know, I'll give you lots of leeway on this because I agree with you. I think it's Atlas Shrugged. Ayn Rand nailed it. We're kind of halfway through. Maybe we're a thousand pages before, but we're chipping off pages. I mean, I always say a thousand pages. It's got to be down to 900 by now. What's the timeline? And does that timeline differ depending on what part of the world you're in? So my gut feeling is that between here and the end of the century will be a decline of, I don't know, 50 to 90% of the global population. And so that's like three generations, I think, that we have left to go, three or four generations. And it's funny, you hear that statistic and your instant reaction is, oh, my God, there'll be bodies in the street. There'll be like massacres. It doesn't have to work like that. Um, so people's ability to understand the power of exponential growth is our, our intuitions are off. Like you actually go through the maps and you, nothing seems to happen. And then suddenly there's an explosion and everything changes when, when the curve suddenly goes up. The same thing happens for contraction. So this is a little thought experiment that I love running past people. At the moment, the global population has an annual 2% growth rate and 1% death rate, 2% birth, 
1% deaf. So there's a net 1% growth rate in the population. And this has been happening for long enough that people just think that's normal. But what it means is every 70 years, you double the population on the planet. And can you imagine going from like 8 to 16 billion people, like how crazy things would get here in just 70 years? And that's the time scale I'm talking about. So flip that around. Imagine now instead we have a 2% death rate and a 1% birth rate every year. That's not Armageddon. It's just slightly different. Imagine you're in a village of 100 people and previously there were two babies and one funeral every year. Flip that around to two funerals and one baby. You'd barely notice the difference year to year. But if you are in a 1%... right now. Sorry? Arguably that's happening right now. Yeah, the the, the demographic change is happening now and it's it's going to be more than a 1% change per year. But you suddenly are going from doubling the population in 70 years to halving it in 70 years. No catastrophe needed. It's just a change in the dynamic. The big catastrophe is going to be for the economic system that manages everything that's built on the expectation of growth that's happened in the last 100 years. The growth is going to go away and we're not going to be able to paper it over anymore. Or maybe we will keep papering it over. Maybe we will be you know, spending trillion dollar uh, digital credits to buy like a sandwich and people just think that's normal. Well, they'll just come up with a new name for it. So it won't be like a trillion, it'll be like a trilly or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, oh, I yeah. mean, this has happened before. Like there were, there's were, there been governments that just added zeros to the ends of their dollars. That's kind of what Bitcoin's along. getting you ready for, my, you know, in a lot of ways. It's like you're working with transactions that are seven or, you know, I usually work with it's just point one four seven. You know, it's a tiny little fraction of a Bitcoin because you're going to be working with what is a tiny little fraction of a trillion, which is actually yep. like, you know, a $70 million chocolate bar. But, uh, you know, so. And it's funny, I'm not completely unsympathetic to the elites that are trying to steer this like atom bomb that they're strapped to the front of. I don't think they even knew they they were with. I I agree. I mean, I was just arguing with a guy in our Canadian roundup show the other day that I think they just kind of got footed with this thing. And they're just like, this is there's no way out of this thing. It's just it's a time bomb. Yeah. 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 And see, here's the thing. Like they've got unprecedented powers for um, cultural control and for financial control that they've never had before. Um, And they're going to need them to try and stop societies from tearing themselves apart. And so here's the thing, like the Roman empire was relatively peaceful. If you look at like the, the, the murder rate, Um, but it was also very expensive that the people, the average people had to work their guts out to contribute resources to the central authority to keep the whole thing going. So there were many regions that when it collapsed, the individual people left behind were actually wealthier than they were during the time of Roman domination, Um, but they had to deal with their own security. So there were other places that just went into complete bedlam and (laughs) hordes of barbarians going around. Like it was just complete chaos. Yeah, but I don't know if it's, I I flip flop back and forth all the time. I don't know if it would would be like that. You you did a review of a book. Um, I can't remember the book's name now. I was going to write it down. I should have. But it was about the the leaving the the plants and the leaving nature alone, right? And how resilient it is, and how how it, it it always comes back if you leave it alone. But all our intervention that we do, and I feel like it's the same with these elites in humanity. Like the more you try and mess with it, the more it fucks things up. Like just let it be on its own in a way. And well, I think well, like nature will help humanity figure it out. It'll help the ordinary people. What I predict is going to happen with the elites is that these digital tools that they're using to create a kind of soft authoritarianism are going to work so well in the right locations that the elites are actually going to lose the skills for ruling without them. So that when the pipeline of like microchips from Taiwan eventually dries up because it's so complicated that it just needs one ingredient to be missing and the whole thing shuts down, when we finally lose access to these technologies, the elites are not going to know how to govern anymore. Right. And that's when we're going to be in danger of chaos. Right. Or, or the, uh, you know, a CME or the grid goes down or an, an EMP, uh, something that's going to like, we're so fragile now with our yeah. infrastructure basically too. There's no, yeah. there's no way they could, if, if, if things went down that unless they have a controlled demolition of it, um, there's no way they could maintain maintain their leadership i don't think yeah it, it's interesting so yeah i it's funny you hear you hear often that the elites are referred to as like predators or parasites yeah as, as a negative kind of thing like that they're they're like evil 
I actually still see them as predators and parasites, but in a positive way, that in ecology, those species function to stabilize the rest of the system. Um, a, a really good example of this was the introduction of the potato into Ireland. So up until that point, the English, the horrible, evil English, had been extracting resources out of Ireland and immiserating the population of peasants, but keeping them relatively stable. When the potato arrived, because it could be grown underground it was, and it couldn't be put on ships and taken back to England, there was a population explosion in the peasants that the, the English just couldn't manage. And that set up the conditions for the inevitable uh, pathogen to come in and wipe out the crop and cause this like huge catastrophe. So in some ways, the English were incompetent in their ability to manage that population, the next trophic level down in the society. They lost control of the ecosystem. So, um, and it and set up the conditions is, for a collapse. Control is more important than people want to take in because it's not important for everyone. I'm, I, I'm confident that Shane will do fine with no control factors in place. I'm confident <laughs> that Darren would do fine with no control factors. But Graham, I'm still on the fence, but he's trending in the right direction. But you know, when I when I walk through the mall, say if I have to go pick something up from Bass Bro, you know, I'm, when I'm looking around, it's like, you know, nine out of ten, nine out of ten need the control structure. They can't exist outside of it. I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick or NPC or this and that. It's just if they don't have the grocery store, if so many, if if enough levels of convenience are taken out of the thing then either A, they're not going to live, which is drastic, but B, they're, which isn't drastic, is they're, and it's happening already in the in monetary form, is they're not going to reproduce or they're not going to reproduce enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, nope. it, it, it's interesting because I think at least Western countries have the capacity for a couple of generations of soft authoritarianism linked to rationing. So the amount that we consume at the moment is this huge amount of fat that can be trimmed back and still leave enough resources for survival. Um, places like, you know, Haiti, where they were importing cheap industrial grains to like support, barely support their population. They didn't have that buffer. So when but, they, but, but if they were responsible for their own resources and they got the money, but like, I feel like this, I want to tease out that good parasitic part of it. I like, I like what you're saying there. It's interesting, but I feel like they've they've messed the system up to the point where it, it wouldn't now it can't function on its own without this. So so give me an example of something that they're they're uh, they're creating balance on. Um, well, I mean, in the West, for example, the this demographic collapse is unfolding. Like the the reproduction rates of young people. Yeah, but that's their I, fault, though. I mean, this this is what I'm getting at, right? Like but, we're not. I don't see that as a problem. I see it as one of the better pathways to reducing yeah, yeah, the yeah. population without yeah. having to have absolute, you know, massacres or, I mean, it, even pandemics are, are likely in the future if we can't maintain people's health. Right, we, right, right. Like it's not yeah, just starvation. Not the, it, it, it's vigorous. Mm, you have to be vigorous. Yeah, you have to have but, enough food resources to be able to fight off infections. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess I just don't see overpopulation being a problem yet, as as you do. Like, I I don't see that. I see it being an unnatural. Well, you might have to get dropped into the middle of India before you make that decision, or you know, like because India and China are footing most of the bill on overpopulation. I mean, we're in Canada. There's no, we have zero overpopulation problem, in and even in the USA, maybe parts of Mexico, but I mean, I I don't see an overpopulation problem either and then i went to cairo and i was like holy fuck man how do you people live like this now it, it depends on what resources you're talking about. about and and funnily enough i think food isn't necessarily the most it isn't always going to be the most critical resource going forwards um if we need to go back to using firewood for cooking and heat right right um you well, look at the fuck, landscape yeah. in the 1800s yeah. around those early settler towns they're a moonscape. They cut down right. every tree yeah, to, yeah. to, you know, build houses, function. There's yeah. been regrowth since it's been abandoned yeah. in a lot yeah. of those places, but they're low quality trees. If you wanted to build a house out of them, 
you would struggle compared to the people who like just had to get one huge log. Right. Yeah. That's a good, so there's a good, there's a great point right there. Like, you know, over, over mm -hmm. uh, forestation in certain spots. And so, but cause you've done the calculations right in your own experimental farm, mm -hmm. uh, you've done the cal calculations, like my effort versus output, like, is that enough to sustain yes. me? I mean, that's, it's, so you're, it's coming, really from, you're coming from a scientific like standpoint of like, how can I make enough food resource for myself? Without relying on industrial inputs. That's the, that's the tricky the part. Yeah. And this is a process. So firstly, permaculture, you know, grow your own, all of that stuff has a problem with being fixated on vegetables and fruits, which makes perfect sense when you're living in the suburbs and you've only got a small area to grow because the quality and the monetary return on investment and the interest in it all of those point towards fruits and veggies. But the problem is they only make up like 10% of the human diet. Most of it is staple calories that come from carbohydrates, that come from grains or roots or things like that. And a lot of these people in the suburbs are like, I'll just grow more potatoes, it'll be fine. But if you actually sit down and do the numbers, the amount of reasonable quality land that you need to grow those potatoes for one person is completely impossible in the suburbs that we have, even the relatively widely spread out American suburbs. Um, so a really good example of this, um, there's a book I did a review on called Farmers for 40 Centuries. So an American agronomist traveled through Southeast Asia in the late 1800s and documented how that pre-industrial agriculture was working. And the smallest area of staple crops per person anywhere in the world before we had all of these chemicals to like bump things up was in Japan, where you needed one third of an acre of double cropped paddy rice per person. And who has a third of an acre of land that fertile per person? Um, there's logistical issues as well, too. If you grow potatoes, you need to be able to store them to supply food throughout the year. Grains have the advantage that if you know how to dry and store them, you can um, create a buffer to get you through the ups and downs in production. Potatoes are only a reliable year-round crop in a really small number of places that are consistently warm and rainy throughout the whole year places like Ireland, but um, they're a really rare kind of location. Um, in most of the US, you're frozen for like half of the year. So are you saying with, without mass monocrops and agri and, and mass, uh, what's the word for those big? Staple uh, crops. The, and and, the, and the, the, cow, the, uh, the meat farms and all the meat, uh, what are they called? Mm. The, the industrial oh, the farms and all that. Yeah. And, and with all the fake food, like we couldn't, you don't think we could make without zero, it would be hard to do zero input. To well, look at it this way. Before we added industrial inputs into the agriculture system, we sustained about 600 million people worldwide okay. for thousands of years. That was the limit that we hit. Places that had really good soil tended to become limited in firewood or water, and you built up enough population that you ended up with epidemics, like knocking the population back down. Everywhere else, you had marginal agriculture that supported much lower population densities. And without the ongoing industrial inputs, we are likely to return to something like that 600 right. million people, which okay. is about a 90% drop. Wow. And that's, what, and that's what those people like Jane Goodall and uh, who else has, has said that they need to be at that 500 million <laughs> The yeah, and level. I, mean, I don't think any government has to have a plan to do it. No, I think no, it's no, going to no, happen no. gradually and spontaneously yeah. over the next four generations. So, so what are some of the inputs that, what are, are the inputs that we do? Like, what, are you talking about like uh, water, irrigation? Um, yeah, irrigation is um, a huge one. I would point out that irrigation and water supply for suburbs is also critical. And those water systems were built mostly in like the post-World War II era and they're falling apart. Like, look at the US water infrastructure. The resources to repair and maintain that are going to go away. They are going away. Um, some places are going faster than others. But if you want to pack people in together and them not get dysentery, you need to have a water and a sewage system. Um, just like a, a, a feedlot for, for cattle, you, you need to have water troughs and some form of you know sludge removal. They, they pour it into giant lagoons. But what else for drowning what else in the what else for agriculture, though? Um, so the other big one is phosphorus. So the early stage of industrialization before we had like uh, diesel powered machinery, we had horse drawn um, farm implements using cheap iron and we boosted yields by mining guano phosphorus 
from islands that had had birds on them for like millions of years and shipping it around the world with coal. So phosphorus in many places was the limiting resources on particular as, types as of a, soils. As a fertilizer? As a fertilizer, yes. Um, and we're hitting phosphorus limits with, uh, you know, diesel powered machinery digging up even bigger deposits. There's, there's only a couple of places around the world where you get large phosphorus deposits. And we're pouring so much of it on places like Idaho and uh, the giant cornfields out there that it's washing into the oceans and like polluting the whole of the Caribbean. So that resource is limiting in most places when you don't have it on hand in a bag to just sprinkle it out the back of a machine. Can you, can you talk about your maze uh, experiment? Oh, of course, of course. So um, example, right, of what, how you're calculating this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was one of the recent posts that I did. So I'm in a subtropical climate that is often really, really wet. And during those times, weeds grow like crazy. And at other times, we get really prolonged droughts where just nothing grows for like a year. And it flips back and forth between those states, um, which makes agriculture really, really challenging because um, the emergence of complex civilization built on agriculture probably relied on regions that had reliable cycles of wet and dry. I mean, look at Egypt with the Nile flooding exactly the same time every year. That was, a, that was on easy mode. Um, when you come to somewhere like Australia's wheat belt, we'll get rain for three years and then we'll get a flood and then we'll get a drought for five years. If you wanted to drop a medieval village in the middle of that and create a granary, I mean, good luck. The, the droughts are going to be so long that there's no way you can store enough grain to get you through those periods. Um, and for this reason, I view maize as a minor crop for me. It, it's useful to get the genetics while I can. Maybe it'll be more useful for other people in different places and times in the future. But that's the first issue I have. If I can't plant a crop by a particular time in summer because we're having a drought year, there's just no crop that year. That's about 20 to 30% of the time, the season's just gone which I think is a bit too high for it to be the main staple for us. Okay, so flip around. The other issue is how do you prepare the land to get the crop growing? Because if you've got weeds that are chest deep, you can't just plant the crop into that. So rather than physically removing all of those weeds every time I want to plant a crop, I've uh, tapped into what's called an Inga Alley system. So this was developed in Central America to replace shifting slash and burn agriculture that they do up in the rainforests. So the traditional system there is that you cut all the rainforest down, you burn it, and then you grow your maize crop in that weed-free, high-nutrient residue. And after you grow that crop, you let it go back to rainforest for like 20 years before you think about doing it again. Um, with the current population densities, it's not possible to rest the land for long. So this institution developed a system of planting a fast-growing legume tree in these dense alleys and when they're still immature, they canopy over and all of the weeds underneath them die. And when you want to grow a crop, you cut that tree back and it produces all of the biomass, which contains the nutrient for the crop. So I've been implementing that here in Australia. I think I'm the first person here doing it because um, the ice cream bean tree had been introduced and people were demonizing it as like this weedy, horrible thing. It's relatively well behaved in my region, but some other places nearby, it's a bit worse. But anyway, so I've been doing this for about 10 years now and experimenting with how to grow maize as the main calorie crop in amongst this uh, ice cream bean tree, this Inga tree that provides the weed control and the fertilizer and firewood as well. Like if you want to eat the maize at the end, you need a source of wood that's reliable so that you can you can cook it. And the last season, I, I wrote this on my Substack as a post, I analyzed how many days worth of energy I put into establishing all of that versus how many days worth of energy I got back in the form of maize. And it was actually slightly less than one on one. I invested, I think, 16 days worth of work and I got 11 days worth of calories back. So at this stage in my life, I'm not determined to scale everything up to the point that I'm producing all of my calories. I would wear my body out so quickly. Like I'm, I, I grew up in the suburbs. I, I don't have that peasant uh, connective tissue strength that comes from doing agriculture from like the day that you can walk. <laughs> um, but I am very focused on coming up with crops that do give you more return than you put into them, that you could actually use that as a foundation for a local agricultural society. And I'll, I mentioned this in the post that I made a, several mistakes with the crop this year and that I could have got as high as I think three or four um, times return on the energy invested, which is enough for subsistence. Oh, so okay. I need to get so, better so, at yeah. not making those mistakes. So it could have. So you could have got 
could have got more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does this make you think at all about like an ideal kind of like tribal quality quantity of people or like a zone of community that you could all sort of, you know, trade labor, even if you, when you need to sort of, you know, push something out, you could, you could combine your labor, you know, like the, kind of like the self-sufficient sort of farm community feel like do you, do you have like an idea now of how how many people and I how have, wide of a range i have an ideal but there is no way that you can convince people today that it's worth spending 16 days of labor to grow i think what ended up being about ten dollars worth of corn if you'd bought the industrial equivalent from the shop like the, the, that's less than you know oh, no, not for corn but for for everything for everything yeah exactly. um so my current focus is still gathering the genetics that, and trialing and proving the genetics that works under my local conditions. Um, when I get too old to do that, when my body's not strong enough, um, sorry, during this initial phase, I'm also sharing all of the genetics that's showing promise with everyone in Australia that's interested. Like I'm, I'm selling it for far less, less than it's worth. Um, and again, people are comparing the prices I sell seeds for with the industrial seeds that you can buy at like the mega supermarket that were produced in a greenhouse and like struggled to grow outside in real soil. Um, so that's the current phase in my life. And I'm very cognizant that I've, I'm not going to convince anyone to be a madman like me and spend 16 days growing $10 worth of corn. Like it, nobody's going to do that. I'm hopeful that when I get to the older stage of my life, I can shift to building community and sharing the resources and making sure that they continue after I'm gone because it's very, very easy to lose this genetics. And once it's gone, it's almost impossible to replace. I mean, these locally adapted varieties used to be all over the world. Every little village would have their own strain of wheat, their own strain of corn. And um, anytime you get a flood of industrial product coming in, that's, you know, 1% the price of the local sustainably produced product, there's just no way it can compete. So the lines end up being lost. So well, restoring them is, is a big effort. Because, yeah, you've mentioned them. And instead of making the land changing the land to make it work for stuff you think you're supposed to grow, mm. keeping the land as it is and grow what's supposed to grow there. Yeah. Well, how, how yeah. does somebody like Darren, if Darren wanted to make a food forest or, or, you know, in, in his property or me in my backyard, like how do you figure out what's supposed to be there? So what, the first what thing would I would recommend without changing the land too much, you know? Yeah. So the first thing is to source genetic diversity of crops that have a reasonable chance of doing well in your local ecosystem. Um, so if you have a history of agriculture, they would have tried everything already. So you'll at least know, oh, this is a wheat belt, like wheat does well here. But around you is probably being grown industrial wheat that produces huge yields, but it needs all of these inputs that aren't going to be sustainable. So the key is to cast as wide a net as possible to source these pre-industrial wheat genetics, grow them all side by side, let them cross-pollinate each other, and then start selecting out the varieties that perform the best on your particular patch of land and start recreating this patchwork of genetic diversity that is a lived experience in the ecosystem around you. Um, and if you still have a partially selected, highly diverse, like hybrid swarm, when the climate starts changing, it's going to be in more of a position to change along with it. Those are great answers. Yeah. Darren, Darren, do you have anything? No, I'm, I don't see myself planting much. You know, I got plenty of Saskatoons growing all over the place here. And I, you know, I'm a predator. I'd probably take on some cows maybe, but I mean, I'd more likely just hop on my horse and go shoot some. My, my personal pick going forward the the animal that's probably going to be the most useful is the dairy goat. So I have dairy goats, and the energetic analysis of them blows everything else out of the water. Wow, I was going to ask you why you had all the goats. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're because they're smaller than them? cows. They reproduce more quickly, and it's easier to adjust their populations up and down. Like the scalability of a solution is a big issue, and I think this I is a big like reason why tree crops aren't a huge priority because the the time scales to increase the generations are so slow that it's always going to be a marginal kind of thing and when you have a disaster in a tree crop it takes you generations to like build it all back up again and you're going to starve in the meantime whereas annual crops and livestock like small livestock like goats that produce a continuous high quality calorie and protein like the fat and the protein that comes out of goat is like nothing else um and the resource that's likely to be available for them in the future 
all of this abandoned land that's turning back into weeds and shrubs is the perfect thing for goats to turn into food for humans. Huh. Interesting. What do you feed your dogs? There's a question in the chat. <laughs> um, so my dogs are only half sustainable. Um, their diet is half yogurt from the goats and they get half a kibble mix as well huh. that I buy. So here's the weird thing. Like this was a classic thing when we first moved onto the farm and got the dairy goats. Our first Christmas, I sat down and I had a bowl of homemade zero input goat milk chilled in a refrigerator like powered with coal and I poured cocoa pops on top of it. And, and it, that just symbolized where we are in history. So we are still very much in the middle of a global industrial system. And the idea that we can just like snap our fingers and wave a magic wand and turn back into 16th century peasants is a fantasy. We can't do that now, but we can gather the resources that people will use to reclaim comparable lifestyles in the future. Right. So you use, you use whole, whole goat milk then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're we mostly turn it into yogurt. That's my favorite. Very nutritious compared very to nutritious. pasteurized milk. Uh, I have some of it raw, um, but yeah, the the goat is uh, the yogurt is effectively pasteurized too. It makes it a bit more digestible, a bit more stable. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and yeah, we process our own animals, so probably a third to a half of our meat comes from our goats because there's always too many. Um, again, like I'm functioning like a a king, like an aristocrat, I'm managing my goat peasants because if I just let them breed and go everywhere, the population is going to get so big that either wild dogs are going to come in and do the job for me or some disease is going to break out when they start experiencing nutritional stress. So I'm, I'm constantly acting as a, as, as a balancer for that, the, that productive life power. How many acres? We have 40 acres. The goats regularly graze about 10 of them. They get moved every few days. Um, I use mobile electric fencing to do that now. Um, if I had to do it myself without all of that technology, I would need to be out there herding them for about four hours a day, take them out twice a day. When we have droughts, that 10 acres isn't enough to sustain the herd. So I also have fodder trees planted all over the place that I cut branches for to get them through the droughts. Wow. I feel like I could have so many goats running around here because I, we're pulling. There's pulling enough hay off the the fifty acres by the lake now to feed the six or seven horses all winter. Because mm -hmm. that's like. So what are you doing in the winter? Are you pulling hay for the winter? For you don't have winter. We don't have winter. We're kind <laughs> of like northern Florida is our climate, so we get a touch of frost occasionally. Um, our our off season is late is spring is relatively dry and occasionally we get a drought that goes through into summer um so yeah we, d we don't have the the challenges with having to put up hay i would so the drought is to look at tree hay as an alternative to annual hay if you can establish banks of trees that maintain some leaves in the winter which i think you have some species well i've um, got and you can also cut I've got yeah, you can also cut um, summer leaves off trees and dry them and use them as hay as well. Oh, interesting. My my horses are always eating the leaves for sure because mm. I've got, you know, 20, 15 or 20 acres, of, well, maybe 15 acres of trees on the property. Mm. So then they're all growing tons of leaves. So is it, it's worth bagging all those leaves, I guess. It would be the same as, as rolling hay. That's just as valuable of a resource. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you get kindling at the same time. I have so much deadfall to start chopping up and just, I'm just going to pile it. My plan is just pile it wherever it lies right now, but there's probably a hundred cords of wood on the ground in and amongst the property right now. Yep. It's fucking so, nuts. See, this is the interesting thing. If you take away the diesel and the machinery, you very quickly get back to a manpower limitation to anything that you want to do, um, particularly transportation. Like that's the, that's the circulatory system of the the global squid. Um, and it's another choke point that's potentially going to, you know, have a stroke or a heart attack, uh, at least that's in, why. on a regional basis. That's why I want it all chopped up, even if it's off, you know, in the back 40, but it's just, okay, there's three deadfall here, pile them up right here, and they're in, you know, 18 inch, because now I just got to split them. I'm not like trying to axe a tree down into pieces and, you know, it becomes a real... But I'm, I, dude, I got like a wood furnace stash just in case. I'm, I'm very well prepared for this bitch to come down. I like <laughs> winter because it means I'll have to less shoot less people trying to steal my shit. 
Um, so as an example, I'm building an outdoor wood-fired kitchen at the moment for storing food and like cooking large batches of things and drying food because it's usually wet here during the middle of a um, harvest season. So being able to dry fruit would be an amazing advantage. But for powering that, um, I've got all of these support trees that I can cut for wood, but I don't want to do a huge amount of cutting. And a lot of it is really like twiggy, awkward material that's awkward to bring back to burn. So my plan is to cut those trees on a whole branch scale and then burn the wood in the location and convert it into charcoal because that's a much higher energy density. It's easier to handle it, like it's already broken up into small pieces. And I'm in the process of getting a couple of donkeys to help me cart that material in bulk back to the wood-fired kitchen. What about, uh, so how, what are you doing? How much solar do you need to run your well? Um, so we are running our water system off the roof. So in Australia, we generally have water tanks and we've we've got so much stored. In a, in a distant post-industrial future, when you don't have the pumps and you don't have the plastic tanks or the metal tanks, you would have to go back to the tr- tradition of hauling water from local water bodies. And we've, we've got relatively limited surface water in Australia. We have a boundary creek, but during a drought, it turns into like a, a muddy puddle. What about just to, like, I've got a well. I mean, I obviously my pump, pumps aren't going to work if the power goes out, but the solar seems to be almost to the point where you could be pulling up water most of the time. Yeah, again, that's a great solution for the next generation or th- maybe three, depending on how stable things stay in different regions. But at some point that really, really complicated, fragile technology is probably not going to be sustained anymore. So keeping a mind to looking forward to how humans could occupy the landscape differently, I I think is an important skill. I mean, Australia, our semi-arid regions, which would be amazing for nomadic uh, societies in the future, they're currently all just like mega um, barbed wire cattle farms. Um, they all rely on tapping into our artesian like water supply, like our groundwater. Um, how sustainable that's going to be in the long term, who knows? It, it's interesting because when you have a technology, there's always going to be one potential choke point. So um, a, a really good example of this is in Australia and the Americas before Europeans turned up, the technology for chopping wood, for chopping trees was really, really limited. So you could use a stone axe. Um, There were copper axes, I think, in some parts of the US as well for a little while until they exhausted the resource. But cutting a tree with those techniques limits how big the tree can be, particularly if you have no bison or or like uh, uh, steers, like cattle, for dragging those logs to a location to use them. Like there's a limit to how big uh, uh, a piece of wood humans can move around. So really interesting story. In my region, when the first uh, timber getters turned up, they went to the local uh, Indigenous people and said, oh, we'll we'll give you, we'll trade you a metal axe or a metal cooking pot or a knife if you show us where the really good trees are that we're looking for, like these particular types of trees. And the Aborigines are like, sure, that's, that's a really amazing tool. That'll make our life so much easier. And they took them to one by one to all of these giant old growth trees that got cut down by these new metal tools that the averages never had the tools to cut down before. Um, A train line was put through to my town and all of these trees were sent to London. Like there's docks in London that were built with trees from my backyard. And eventually all the trees were gone and the the whole economy of the the town collapsed and we're we're like a ghost town now. We're, We're just the remnants that's turning into suburbia. But my point is, the idea that these indigenous people had this like painting with the colors of the wind and like worshiping these giant trees is bullshit. They didn't have the technology to now allow them to exploit them. And um, as soon as they were introduced to that new technology, they started using it in much the same way that the evil Western people did. I mean, look at all of the, um, the fur hunters and trappers in North America that were using rifles supplied by the Westerners that were used to like wipe out beavers and completely transform ecosystems. Oh, they didn't wipe out the beavers. Trust me. There's plenty of fucking beavers running around this motherfucker. Maybe not in Louisiana anymore. I heard they sold Louisiana based on how many beavers were in it. Mm. That was the, uh, the factory used to figure that out. Well, Shane, this has been fantastic. Time flies. 
when you're having fun. We'll have to do this again down the down the road as long as the sure technology. Thing. I love cool, talking bro. civilization. Should I, should I plug my stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where can people find everything? <laughs> And your okay, book, so, and your yeah, upcoming book. book. So yeah. three ways you can, well, four ways you can find me. So the first easiest way, I have a podcast that I talk to amateur plant breeders all around the world doing similar work to me called the Going to Seed Podcast that comes out every two weeks, twice a month. I also have a Substack called Zero Input Agriculture, where every week I put a post up detailing, like in detail, the experiments that I'm doing on the farm, sometimes book reviews, sometimes a bit of philosophy, a little bit of fiction in there too. The third thing that's coming out, which I'm really excited, is a book, a short book called Taming the Apocalypse. So, and it's an, it's an investigation into the power of hands-on biotechnology to lead humanity through the crisis ahead of us to entirely new forms of civilization. Um, it's more like a manifesto than an almanac, but it also features a survey of the entire tree of life for domestication potential that we just haven't tapped into yet. Um, so all sorts of fun things in there. And the final thing, if you're interested in my fiction, I have written a series of four novellas that make one big chunky novel called Our Vitreous Womb. It's a hard biological science fiction set in a distant future where society is built entirely on biological technology. So there's no rocket ships, there's no robots, there's no computers, there's no gleaming laboratories. It's all just biology. And I've built like a whole civilization with characters like, you know, finding their way through that new kind of uh, lifestyle. Awesome. Oh, and it's published under the name Haldane B. Doyle. Uh, I've got Very a website, nice. uh, author website for that too. So I'll, I'll send you all the links so that you can post them up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks. This was a blast. Absolutely. Well, when, I, this has been great. We're living at a really exciting time in history where small things that we do now have the potential of growing into like whole new systems and ecosystems and cultures and civilizations just based on one little tiny experiment that we do today. Yeah. I like that. Well said. Thank you. Absolutely. This has been good. This has been great. Hopefully it sticks around. I mean, I think we got some time, but I can go either way. I mean, I'm Mad Max does excite me. I do. I get excited by the idea of, you know, just uh, the whole thing just sort of excites me. Just possibilities. Like yeah, the time down. when there were cowboys and samurais on the earth, earth right. at the same time, and you could get a steamship and a train to go from one to the other. Exactly. Like, and if you yeah. step on my property, I can shoot you. That too. That's a, <laughs> you know, like no one's telling me I have to get a shot or anything like that. I said, what? What? You better turn around and keep on walking, boy. You know, I could get into, we, we came a little too far maybe, but I still want the internet because it, you know, pays for my life. So. <laughs> That's kind of nice. Shane, this has been fantastic. We will have to do this again. Come back anytime and have, I guess it's uh, still early over there tomorrow. So have a great tomorrow. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. And that was our chat with Dr. Shane Simonson, Taming the Apocalypse. What'd you think? Oh, it was a blast. I love it. Yeah, it was really good. Everyone. Kind of made me look at things a little bit differently too with population and resources and stuff it's good well and then they got this the jibbity jabbers in there to help accelerate that to maybe a four to one you know and then all of a sudden in two generations you're down to that number maybe i should have another kid anyway how long do i think we have uh i don't know i i we probably have longer than we think honestly it's just gonna get harder stuff's gonna get harder to get uh, more intricate stuff so you might want to figure some of that stuff out i guess but i think we got some time but i live my life like we don't and i prepare like we don't if i have an idea of something that i think i should get for my prepping it becomes like it's not a next year or this or that it's usually like okay as soon as i can get that shit together and if i you know if it's not super expensive if it's something i can just do right away then i, I tend to just do it right away pow okay like you know we figured out the canning and the tallow and all that sort of stuff because there's so many cows running around this bitch that at least for my generation i could just be wrangling up wild cows for the foreseeable future i think like a real cowboy five or six million head of cattle roaming around alberta and if all this shit turns back to grassland and i can't see how all the like because you know, all the city people will be dead. 
and uh, a lot of other people. And I just think that uh, by the when we do get to those further out generations, when the stuff really starts breaking down, there's going to be so many antelope and deer and everything running around again that that maybe we can hopefully because I I'm a firm believer that we're meant to eat the things that are eating the grass. Not I'm not interested in eating grass or grass by I do eat vegetables. You know, I think I have to have broccoli tonight. I don't mind broccoli, but I don't think I need broccoli to survive. I think I can survive off of. Uh, fat and things and i think that you know maybe run into a vitamin c problem but i think you could offset that with those little red things that sean is always collecting make some juice out of them or something i don't know i mean you did the carnivore i think you could just go on forever like that yeah probably yeah Yeah. anyway big thanks to shane for coming on the show big thanks to you guys for listening even bigger thanks if you are one of the few who choose to support work here so that we can keep doing this kind of stuff you get some value from the show i mean a great chat with shane probably added some value to your life if you did get a little value send some value back our way this is a lot of work a lot of effort a decade and more of bringing out these shows all the time working seven days a week by america.ca slash support if you can when you can sign up for monthly or make a one-time donation uh and it'll be super helpful be valuable makes us feel loved and uh, helps us keep the lights on. We got carbon tax and everything else up here in Canada. It's getting crazy. So grammarica.ca slash support if you can. When you can, if you guys like audiobooks, head over to adultbrain.ca and check all that stuff out. There's YouTube, there's podcasts, there's Spotify, there's Audible, you name it. And grammaricaoutlaw.ca for all the sort of racy stuff that society doesn't want us talking about too much. And there's outlawed Canadians for all the Canadian stuff. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Somehow I built a rocket ship Out of the stuff dreams are made and popsicle sticks Please look at my rocket ship schematic Tell me you can fly to the moon Tell me I'm not a lunatic Countdown, three, two, one, no hesitation.